Hi there, welcome to Active Intelligence. I'm Aaron Ironside. I hope you'll spend the next half an hour with me as we take a look at some very topical issues from a variety of perspectives. The kinds of perspectives that sometimes get you in trouble, if not online, maybe with the law. As we look at hate speech today on Active Intelligence. On today's episode, I spoke with Professor Paul Moon from AUT, who at the recent Forum on the Family delivered an excellent presentation on the reality of hate speech laws overseas and how difficult they are to really get right here in New Zealand, as we've seen, of course, uh, in more recent times with our very own politicians unable to explain exactly what would be a crime under the proposed hate speech laws. But let's go back to the beginning of this journey. It was Labour MP Louisa Ward who believed that somehow hate speech laws might have prevented the Christchurch mosque attack. I mean, certainly it's true. We understand that things like the Holocaust didn't start with gas chambers. It started with rhetoric. And so it's true of so many other atrocities. But is it really true that a hate speech law could have averted the Christchurch mosque attack? I think that uh, hate per se and racism per se has been on the increase. We know from the Human Rights Commission data that we've seen a nearly 30% increase between 2016 and the latest data that came out in 2018. I think that uh, the discussion about what hate speech does, about how racism, sexism, Mm. homophobia does affect particularly our young people, yes, if we'd started this conversation earlier, I think that there was an ability, could have been an ability to better educate the public to better then prevent um, what I saw as racism in terms of the cartoons ever being published. Okay, we'll get to the cartoons shortly, but I'm talking specifically about that Christchurch attack. Can you draw a direct link between so-called hate speech and the Christchurch attack? Well, the damage to society by allowing the speech to be perpetuated is that it becomes normalised. So would different hate speech laws have stopped the Christchurch attack? I believe they would have in the long term because we would have called it out. That person wouldn't have been able to exist with those attitudes and have them unchecked. I mean, the biggest issue uh, that we have, I believe, and Professor Spoonley, who I agree with, has said, in addition to law reform, we actually need better education. We need yeah. to call it out, which is exactly this is why what I he love. said, though. Hey, yeah. This is what Professor Paul Spoonley said. There is not necessarily a direct causation between the presence of Islamophobia and what happened in Christchurch. A direct causation. That's not to say that he's not suggesting there has been an increase in, in racist rhetoric mm. in, in society or anything like that. But he's saying direct causation there. So the experts aren't convinced that there's a direct line that can be drawn between hate speech and hate crimes. Of course, the indirect line is pretty obvious. Hate speech reveals the hatred in the heart and the motives that lead to criminal acts. But of course, there are lots and lots of examples of speech that is offensive, that might be deemed hateful, that didn't lead to anything other than someone being told by their friends or online community or actual live community that that kind of attitude won't fly around around here, buddy. Uh, Of course, there are many who are concerned, and rightly so, about hate speech laws. Uh, Act leader David Seymour is one of those who expressed his concerns on TVNZ's Q&A. My concern is that free expression is one of the most important parts of the human condition. We all experience the world differently, and we should be able to talk about that and express our thoughts and feelings. Uh, Secondly, not only is it a very important human value, but it's an important part of how we work through our troubles as a society. So if you look at the places in the world that have managed uh, to actually fight bigotry and Mm. racism, it's the places where we actually allow people to discuss their differences and work through them on the basis that sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. But that's not true anymore, David, because words do hurt. And we know from NetSafe uh, and an assessment that they do that 30% of adults uh, suffer from online hate. Uh, But worse is action stations report where 20% of our young people uh, suffer from hatred because of online bullying. And we know now that that psychological damage leads to self-harm and suicide. 
And it's already a crime, for instance, to incite somebody uh, to suicide. It's already a crime to threaten someone with violence. Mm -hmm. It's already a crime to incite somebody else to commit violence. But actually, the more things change, the more they stay the same, because what Larissa is really yeah. proposing uh, is to give the power of a censor to decide what is allowed to be said and what is not. And my principle is very simple. Nobody should ever be punished by the state on the basis of opinion. So our politicians are going head to head on this hate speech law of course like so many issues it does appear to be the left versus the right on this one and of course our government who no longer has to worry about partners like the greens can bulldoze this hate speech law into legislation should they wish however i suspect that the fact that they've been caught out a few times in the public arena not being able to answer simple questions like what's going to be considered hate speech i mean will okay boomer be considered hate speech and of course nobody really knows the answer to that and that's the problem isn't it that we're not really talking about hate speech in that respect speech that incites violence incites criminal activities already illegal what we're really talking about is offense and that's an entirely different issue because offense it turns out of course is an essential ingredient of robust free speech as jordan peterson explains my sense is often you're in a situation where you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, so you might as well pick the poison you'd rather take. And that, and you, you have a moral obligation to do that. So, you know, if you're going to say something unpopular and you're going to get attacked for it, the, that's a risk. But to shut up and pretend that you think something different is to warp your soul. And that's a much bigger risk. So popular commentator Jordan Peterson, he's on the side that says hate speech is impossible, it's ridiculous, in fact, it's going to restrict genuine and good free speech and in fact, things that often offend, uh, like as he points out, Martin Luther King Jr., lead to positive change, even though uh, the first time around it was quite offensive for people to hear what was said. So let's not uh, presume that offense is always the problem. So hate speech, though, is not the answer, is it? Because we have so many protections under the law already that says you cannot say, go and kill all the blue people. I mean, that, that's against the law to say something like that, to actually incite a violent act. We already have defamatory laws that protect people from being uh, abused in the public arena. So why do we need a, a fresh law? How will a new law help. Well, I caught up with AUT Professor of History Paul Moon to ask him whether or not we need any new hate speech legislation. Well, you're absolutely right. At the moment, you can't defame someone, you can't incite someone to commit violence or any sort of crime. So we already have limitations on speech, and arguably these limitations are working well, and I think they're very important. Unrestrained speech can be quite dangerous, there's no question about that. What the government is proposing, however, is something quite different. It deals with the potential of effectively offending or insulting certain groups. Now, again, that sounds like a very good idea. I don't think anyone wants to go around insulting people, there's, there's no benefit in that. But what we've seen from overseas experience is that these things very quickly mutate so that they become restrictions on the expressions of your views. And if your views don't follow the prevailing social orthodoxy, then you're in trouble. Well, let's talk about those overseas experiences, first of all. This is one of those occasions where New Zealand is kind of uh, keeping pace, but others have gone further and faster already. What has been the experience? What sorts of things have people done and said that have found them on the wrong side of hate speech laws? All sorts of areas. And we can look to the United Kingdom and Canada as two jurisdictions that are further down the track than we are at the moment. Um, and I should note at this point, by the way, that no jurisdiction has a very clear definition of what hate speech is, which in itself is a problem because you don't know if you're guilty until you're convicted. And that's, that's I think, bad law. But putting that aside, um, there are certain topics. Um, the issue of trans rights, for example, and we've seen overseas that a lot of feminist groups have got into trouble for expressing particular views about that. Um, expressing views about sexuality, um, we've seen groups that are Bible-based, Quran-based, Torah-based, 
all suffering as a result of that. And this is quite concerning. So it's, it's not just one particular religion that's at risk, a lot of them are. Now, I'm not saying those views are wrong or right, I'm just saying that the ability to express them can be hindered by such legislation. We'll talk more about this issue of being able to define hate speech because this is one of those rare laws where it's not so much about the action but the way the action is received by somebody else. It's almost as if somebody else decides when it's hate speech because they feel angry or offended. Very much so. And and the Human Rights Commission in a report a few years ago talked about this notion of disharmonious speech. If your speech causes disharmony, therefore it may well be hateful. It's not not certain, but it contributes to its definition. So that really puts the power in the hand of the people who react. So if you say something to me and I I organise a riot to to react to it, then your speech is by definition disharmonious. Well, of course, it's worse than that, isn't it? If, If I say something and you are simply deeply offended, you could make a complaint. And surely that sets us up for all kinds of abuses of this kind of law. Yeah, offence is going to be an interesting one. We, we don't know how it's going to work because we don't know even what the law is going to look like yet and how the courts will interpret it. But the, the issue of offence is very interesting because offence isn't a moral wrong. If you offend someone, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're bad. And you can see throughout history, um, for example, in, in the late 19th century, when women in New Zealand were advocating for the right to vote, a lot of people found their comments very offensive. And, and yet, I would argue their cause was a good one. Um, and you can see throughout history, the same thing applies. So just because it offends someone doesn't mean that it's a wrong opinion in itself. We have highlighted another interesting nuance here, and that is what offends ebbs and flows over time based on cultural norms. It's one of the weaknesses here that we're assuming that what is deemed offensive and hateful today will be for all time. Of course, and that's that's a very arrogant position to think that we've somehow reached the top of the mountain now, that our particular social and moral values are the best that they can ever be, the most enlightened that they can ever be. Um, And look, you only have to dip into history to find the same view applying centuries ago. In the 1830s, for example, um, it was common for people in parts of the West, and say Britain and America, to think it's perfectly morally justifiable to own other human beings in the form of slavery. And they felt they were at the moral apex at that time. So um, without an objective moral basis, society necessarily is subjective in its morals, and they keep evolving and mutating depending on all sorts of forces. So the presumption that the way we see things now is the best of all things isn't necessarily true. I think that's delusional. We know that recently our own politicians were unable to provide the media with any really firm examples of what would qualify as hate speech, which has left many of us wondering, how would the courts even be able to apply such a law? Where is the measuring stick? Well, there isn't one. It's the short answer. And, and I mean, you could look at one key word in, in one of the reports recommending this legislation. It says the key word is intent. They're trying to measure what the intent was of the words that were spoken. And this is a real problem because how do you get inside someone's head to work out precisely what their intent was? And when a stranger is doing that in the form of a judge or the police arrest you or whatever, it, it's, it's a problem. Well, we can understand what the upside is supposed to be, that somehow these kind of hateful and insightful words no longer whip up sentiment that could be dangerous to other people. That's certainly the aspiration of the law. But what's the dark side? I mean, in effect, what happens when you tell a community, if you have the wrong set of ideas, you need to keep those to yourself? Well, there are two points there. Firstly, um, this, hate, this type of hate speech legislation of the sort that's roughly proposed for New Zealand hasn't eliminated hate anywhere. And I'm unaware of any example in the history of the world where someone has passed a law and it's eliminated the thing, the hate that it's trying to address. That, that's not how humans work. And I think it's quite naive if you put any faith at all in, in threatening people to remove hate. In fact, I think there's plenty of evidence to show that the opposite happens. And a, a good parallel example is that of racism, that we have legislation that effectively prohibits racism, but it hasn't removed the curse of racism. What it's done is it's forced racism underground. It's it's made it far more subtly expressed. It's camouflaged it. So racism still exists in society, but it's just harder to prosecute people for it because precisely because of the legislation that 
that makes it illegal. Now, I'm not saying we should legalise any expression of racism, but it's not an answer to legislate. There are better ways of doing it. And more practically, what does happen if this sort of speech gets driven underground? Does it get its own kind of more sinister life now that it exists below the surface? It does. It changes the complexion of beliefs. So, and we can see this in, in the case of Eastern Europe during the communist era, that um, Christianity, for example, was driven underground. And it, that in itself became an attraction for some people. They thought this is subversive or dangerous. We want to indulge in it. Um, but for, for the most of society, it meant less exposure to views. So if you drive something underground, most people are less exposed to it. And we're not talking about necessarily about hate in this case, we're talking about views that are contrary to a prevailing moral standard in society. Well, it's interesting that you've used the uh, the church going underground as an example because it's the church, of course, the Christian community and faith communities in general who are very concerned about this kind of legislation, particularly because they fear it will prohibit being able to freely express a set of beliefs. Will there be any protections for the pastor who wants to teach what the Bible, for example, says on a controversial topic? This is the concerning point, and it's interesting that um, and I've, I've talked to a... Um, representative of a um, Muslim organization about this and she she was concerned as well for her faith because there are parts from the three major religions in, in New Zealand um, Abrahamic religions anyway there are parts of their books that could be considered could be regarded as hate speech and that's certainly been the case in England that there have been people who have um, posted particular verses from the Bible and it's, it's gotten in a lot of trouble one of the concerns about the proposed legislation is that no one so far has said if there will be exemptions and if so, where do they lie? So, for example, if a minister is giving a sermon in church about a particular topic, will he or she be protected because of the special status of a religious organisation? No one's actually said that that protection will be in place. And it goes further. If you're sitting around the dinner table at home and you have some friends over and you say something that friends perhaps find distasteful or hateful, are you protected? Well, again, there's no indication so far that you'll be protected, even in private conversations. You've talked about the fact that when there is less kind of free and available speech, people aren't exposed to certain ideas. Uh, it sounds like you're assuming that somehow it's good for us to hear ideas that we don't agree with, ideas that may in fact upset us. Is it good for us? It absolutely is. And, and John Milton, the great poet um, in the 1600s, wrote about this, and he said that if we have a belief that we haven't tested, and this is a paraphrase, then it's not, not a worthwhile belief. He said we've got to put our beliefs to the fire to test what they're like, to see how robust they are. are they, you know, in a sense, are they bulletproof ideas or what's wrong with them? And unless you do that, unless you challenge what you believe and explore and investigate it, um, what's the basis of it? it? It can be pretty flimsy. It seems that one of the things that even the idea of a hate speech law is revealing is our inability to have conversations, that we don't know how to debate and discuss well. We get offended so easily. So many topics are so polarizing in the world in which we live that we'd rather cut off a friendship than necessarily agree to disagree or, or explore ideas that are different to our own. I mean, how can we do better and how do we resist this kind of idea that we've all become at one level so very very prickly and easy to offend and that, that's a crucial point because it wasn't always this way if you go back 150 years or so ago you'll find that in a lot of societies people were very open to alternative ideas no but, but there was a whole skill and culture about how to address them so it's not about attacking the person if you say something i don't like i i don't attack you and uh, you know may, maybe attack an organization you belong to your beliefs your appearance whatever your ethnicity i don't that, that's that's a poor way of dealing with things. It's basically saying, I haven't got any better ideas, so I'll attack the person. But there's a whole culture of how to deal with things fairly, rationally, and intelligently to discuss ideas. And I think we've largely lost that. And this proposed legislation is a response to that cultural change that we no longer are able to engage sensibly with ideas. It very quickly descends into the personal realm. And so this type of legislation is really a, a sticking plaster to address a, a deficient culture in that area. Is hate speech just free speech? No, there are distinctions. And I think it's very careful not to, not to simply think, well, 
um, all speech should be permitted. There are types of speech that absolutely are hateful. And, and let's be clear that that speech has consequences beyond hurting people. And we've seen, uh, for example, in the 1930s in Germany, the rise of the, the Nazi party, um, the sort of speech that they were advocating, particularly with the destruction of whole ethnic and religious and cultural groups, was absolutely hateful. And our laws already cover that sort of thing. Should governments, though, be able to police the the inner world of an individual? Uh, how does this breach our, our fundamental human rights to, to think and feel as we wish to? Well, I'd argue when it comes to opinions, they shouldn't. That we should be free to express our opinions and also be free to be disproven. I think that's an important part of it. Um, the problem is it infantilizes the population. If the state says, we know what's best for you, then we have to sit back and go, okay, thank you, parent state. We will take your advice. We will act on it. In reality, of course, what happens, as I said, is that the, the very dangerous types of speech, the speech, sort of speech that incites violence and terrorism and so on, doesn't disappear. It can be concealed in all sorts of ways and it can become actually far more toxic because it isn't openly expressed and exposed to countering views. So what do you recommend are some next steps for people? Is it just engaging in the political uh, process? We've been invited into this kind of discussion by the politicians. Is there more we could do? Um, I, I, and this is just a personal view. I take a very cynical approach to select committee processes, and we've seen that in a number of issues recently where an overwhelming number of submitters have expressed one view and the select committees have completely dismissed that overwhelming majority and go on with what they intended to initially. However, it is worthwhile, I think, contacting MPs. Um, it's interesting that the minister at present who's in charge of this um, is refusing to be interviewed on it. And I think that's partly because of a fairly symbolic interview that he did fairly recently in which he was unaware of some of the details of the proposed legislation, its practice, its implications and so on. So I think that that the promoters of this legislation may be feeling some of the heat. And I think if people contact their MPs to say, look, you know, we just want the freedom to do what we do without offending other people. And even if we do offend other people, it shouldn't be a criminal offence. And this is what the government's proposing to criminalise our speech. Um, that sort of pressure may have some value. At a personal level, one of the dangers here is that when you oppose the hate speech legislation, it can sound like you're almost promoting hate or at the very least dismissing the concerns of others. How do we talk about this kind of legislation without falling into that pothole? And that's a, a very difficult problem because it's a lopsided approach. If you say, I think we should get rid of all hate speech, that's a wonderful idea. Who's going to disagree with that? Uh, if you say, well, I'm not in favour of that, then you come across precisely as you say, as being hateful and, and so on. The problem is that the arguments against this sort of legislation are a bit more involved. They take more than a soundbite. And so the opportunity to discuss it with people, to say, look, the best way to counter hate is not through legislation. And that's proven throughout history. There's not one example in history I can think of where legislation has eliminated hate. It doesn't work that way. It's a very poor view of legislation, I think that's its function. On the other hand though, discussing ideas does eliminate hatred, it does eliminate things that we regard as bad. Slavery is a very good example where free speech conquered slavery, um, the right of women to vote, um, all sorts of other advances that have been made in society, the civil rights movement in the United States where people were imprisoned for their speech and beaten by the police for their speech, but they persisted and they they eventually got rid of a lot of the very restrictive apartheid type laws that the United States had. So free speech has actually been the antidote to hate throughout history. And I think that's an important way of positioning it rather than saying, well, you know, we don't want hate, so we'll support this legislation. Paul Moon makes such an excellent point, isn't it? That the antidote to hatred turns out to be free speech, not prohibiting hate speech. We need to be able to talk. We need to be able to discuss our ideas in an open way. We don't want to drive them underground where they get a kind of life of their own. We already see that online with the echo chamber effect that many of us uh, no longer engage with people online who have a different point of view, which means that the very narrow point of view that we currently hold is the only one we're hearing, which is enforcing that point of view. And that means that we're never really open to growing and changing, and that's a real challenge.
So hate speech, definitely not the answer. I hope that the government will see the folly of this and put it in the bin. Unfortunately, they don't have a good track record of doing the common sense thing, even though they've been caught out when talking to the media that they don't even know what they are proposing at this stage. So let's go back to the other issue then. Offence. Certainly offence can't be a crime. That's ridiculous because offence is just a feeling. And we have so many feelings and they come and go so very quickly and we have them in such varied intensities. We certainly can't criminalise having feelings. But perhaps what we need to do is take more personal ownership. The government perhaps is trying to solve a problem that should be in your hands and mine. Why are we so willing to offend? Why do we so easily post things on Facebook, for example, or social media, knowing that it'll annoy somebody, almost having a bit of gleeful delight that it might, quite enjoying uh, the pushback that will come, the image of throwing the grenade into the room and then just quietly leaving while people argue it out online. It's, it's not fun and it's not bringing out the best in us at all. In fact, it took a teenager to create an app called Rethink, which means that uh, when you have this app, when you go to post online, it simply asks you, are you sure? Are you sure this is what you want to do? And apparently this has already been very successful, particularly among teenagers, helping them realize, no, I'm not sure. I think this will actually be unhelpful. So I thought it would be good to finish today on a more positive note. What can we do to try and minimise the unnecessary offence that seems to surround us? 1. Confront people using offensive speech online by helping them consider the consequences. Tell them, the internet may seem detached, but pain and trauma are very real. How will you feel if the person you target harms themselves or someone else after reading a hurtful message? Your digital footprint is forever and often public. Think of it like a digital tattoo, forever inked on your forehead. Is this something you want your employers, friends, family, or law enforcement to see? While this may not lead to a long-term change of heart for people spreading hurtful messages, it may make them think twice and delete the offending post or tone down their words. Two, label the online speech clearly. Words have power, and while we have to be careful and thoughtful about the words and labels we use, we also should not fear speaking truth especially when it might help a victim of online bias or harassment. Label the words as hurtful or dangerous. If the person using biased speech doesn't seem malicious, take this opportunity to calmly explain why what they're saying is false, unfair, insulting, or upsetting. So if someone tweets a slur at my friend or uses nasty stereotypes, I can step in and say, hey, what you're saying is racist and unfair, and here's why. They will likely react defensively, but making them think is a step in the right direction. If the forum is public, someone else may echo your message, and an internet user with an open mind may remember your words the next time they consider using hateful speech or witness hate and bias online. Three, change the tone. Look, it's tempting to meet prejudiced messages with equally personal and insulting replies, especially when it feels like no one is listening. But research from the Dangerous Speech Project suggests that using a friendlier, more empathetic, or peaceful voice can help de-escalate an online conflict. Here are a couple strategies. Make a connection to the person using hateful speech. Finding common ground might make it more difficult for them to ignore you or dismiss your feelings. Maybe you grew up in similar neighborhoods or in similar economic conditions. Maybe you share an identity. Telling someone, I understand who you are or where you come from may cause them to listen more when you then say, but your behavior is cruel and offensive. Reply with unrelenting kindness. This can be hard when you are internally screaming, but most of the time people using hurtful speech online are seeking attention and hoping people will lash out at them. Don't feed the trolls or the haters or I think that's what the kids say these days. Instead, wear them down with kindness. Use phrases like these. This may not change a person's long-term behavior, but in the short term, you provide no fuel for their fire, and your kindness may de-escalate someone who is obviously engaging in a one-sided, hateful conversation. You might even get an apology. Four, use humor and memes, but use them kindly. A recent trend online involves people using jokes or images to spread vicious or extreme messages. This is dangerous because it turns those messages into a game, allowing people who share them the luxury of saying, it's just a joke, or don't take it seriously. 
This has led to many young people's shame, embarrassment, and harassment as their peers, and then strangers, spread that humiliation with a hashtag, laughing at their expense. There's no reason these same tactics can't be used to spread empathy and denounce stereotypes, with an important exception. It's not funny if your counter speech is to make fun of another person's appearance or identity, or to use your own biases against them. What might this look like then? See a biased message or image? Use your words or even your Photoshop skills to turn it around. Use your sense of humor to soften the blow of labeling something as racist or biased. And use images to tell a story or send a message that promotes kindness. These kinds of posts get more shares than words alone. Finally, don't get discouraged. Minds do not change easily. Our brains literally fight against it, like a cat fights against glassware on the kitchen counter. I had a very specific idea of how counters worked, and now you've gone and introduced this glass, and I can't accept this reality. But eventually, with enough spray bottles, they learn. Sometimes it may feel like you are trying to create an ocean by spraying drops of water into a desert. It may feel hopeless, but minds can change, and you can help. Every drop counts. Well, I know that seems like simple advice. Try a little bit of kindness online, but I think it would go a long way. I think many of us have become keyboard warriors. We've been so frustrated with the way the world is going and the things that people think and do that we want to tell them what we think. Unfortunately, all that's really happening is that we're just alienating each other and making it harder and harder to get along. And perhaps this is where the real issues lie. Certainly not in having to legislate speech and the feelings that precede that speech. Like to hear your thoughts about this. Would you make a submission to this hate speech legislation forum? That the government's asked for your comments. Have you made a comment? What did you tell them? Get in touch, activeintelligence.nz. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button so that every episode will arrive fresh in your inbox every week. And we'll see you next time on Active Intelligence.